Anyway, um, so so it's a pleasure to start the regular um, seminars today, and you know, with, uh, during the last uh, few years, we've been having fantastic speakers and good people coming in, and it was always a pleasure to have uh, friends to come and spend time with us. But I think that the greatest pleasure is when you start to have your previous students come into uh, the seminar series, and mm -hmm. Robin is one of them. So it's really uh, thrilling for me and rewarding to have Robin here. And Robin get, uh, received his, correct me if I'm wrong, received his undergraduate degree from Brown University, and then uh, came to Case Western Reserve University to do his combined degree, MD, PhD, part of the MSDP program there. And one day appeared in my lab and asked if he could work with me, and uh, I accepted. And then we did some, uh, I think, very good and important work that Robin pursued along gap junctions. And it was mostly on gap junctions, although he used modeling to do some other things on ischemia. But really, I think his major contribution was to show the gap junctions are very important in determining conduction in the heart, cell-to-cell -cell communication, and arrhythmias. And after finishing his uh, training at Case, he went to uh, New York, California, and San Francisco, did whatever it takes to become a cardiologist, joined uh, Lily Jan's lab, where he started to do experiments and worked on gap junctions in Louis James' lab from the experimental perspective. And he's <coughs> an assistant professor there in cardiology, medicine. And I visited there not too long ago, and Robin has set up a beautiful laboratory with some very good postdoc fellows and students working there. So it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh, I need to put this on, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that, that'll help. There's only one thing I've changed in that history. I probably never told you. I no, you need to turn on. <laughs> we all want to hear. I don't want to hear. <laughs> 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 I probably don't want to hear. I scared. I scared. Right side is better. that 
and more people would benefit if they take time away from the experiments, away from data acquisition, to just sort of sit alone and, and think about the work. And that, that's a lesson that I don't take lightly, and, and I know I um, learned it directly from you. Um, and so thank you very much. I, uh, all you've done to get me to this point where I get to come back. Um, and so what I um, will be talking about today is really uh, two related stories. The one story um, is on gap junction trafficking. And this is work, work um, uh, that I did uh, with Lauren was to learn that gap junctions are important. And then we so went further with the, the actual mechanisms of trafficking, so which I'll be talking about. And then the next logical step is about how gap junction trafficking can be affected in these days. Um, and this is not the audience that I have to spend a lot of time introducing gap junctions to. Um, but as you all know, in the heart, the B starts in the sinus node, especially the atria, especially the AV node, rather connection system throughout the ventricle. And the point to make is that individual myocytes, and even within the connection system, within the atria, everywhere in the heart, the, the, the spatial sphere of excitation is dependent on gap junction communication, cell to cell of excitation. And this is a pair of freshly isolated myocardial myocytes and with antibody stayed against connective 43, the main isoform of gap junctions in uh, the trypto myocardium. And what you can notice is that there's enrichment of the gap junction at the longitudinal ends of cells, at the so-called interpolated discs. And we know why that is true. We need a longitudinal spread of excitation current. But what we delve into is how is that the case? How is it that gap junctions end up localizing at the interplated disc versus other regions of the cardiac membrane? This is, uh, on your right, a classic slide from Andy Whitchburn in Columbia, where he took a uh, mongrel dog, he tied off one of the main arteries, the LAD, uh, sacrificed the dogs four days later, staying tissue sections for connection 43. Then what he saw, you're all familiar with, in the zone of infarction, there was no cell survival. Uh, 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 no connection 43 uh, uh, remained. W away from the zone of infarction, in healthy myocardium, you see staining of connection 43 at the interplated disc. But in the in-between zone, the so-called border zone of infarction, cells that actually survived the infarction but were affected by it, what you see is actually a down regulation of connective 43 at the interplated disc and even a relocalization at the lateral borders. And just, I don't want to dredge up the past here, <laughs> but um, by way of introduction at least, the down regulation of connections is highly important in cardiac electrical activity. Um, the, this is a fiber model. And the, the actually, these are uh, four points of uh, two adjoining cells in the fiber. Point one is proximal distal end of the first cell, three and four proximal distal end of the second cell, with a gap junction with just normal carbon conductance in between. And what you know is these uh, upstrokes and the action potentials, and the time it takes to travel along the first cell from one to two is about the same time it takes to travel across a gap junction. Um, and that's with normal coupling. And despite the fact that gap junctions you know, span a distance of the order of nanometers, and of course, the my size on the order of microns. In, when gap junction coupling is reduced tenfold, you can see that the individual cells fire almost simultaneously, where the spread, the literally the spatial spread of excitation, is dominated by traversing this uh, gap junction region, which again is only nanometers across. And so the, when you look at spatial spread of excitation in the heart, one really cannot consider uh, 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 excitation uh, without considering uh, what the gap junctions are doing to the natural physiology. One more example, you know, this is work, modeling work, so Jim Weiss has done a lot of uh, um, and experimentally, he's been contributing enormously, Yoram showed me 
to map human uh, waveforms, but at least as a thought experiment, as the two-dimensional computational model. And this happens to be 100 by 100 cells, computational cells, coupled normally. Um, and we're subjecting the two-dimensional plane to uh, um, a two-stimulus protocol. The first stimulus starts at the top, and you see the spread of excitation, red being peak excitation, blue being red in memory potential. And then right to the so-called vulnerable uh, window, or vulnerable period, what we're going to do is introduce a second stimulus from the spinal direction to try to initiate one of these bad rhythms, these so-called arrhythmias or the intrinsic arrhythmias. Well, here comes the second stimulus, and you see they're actually in this 100 by 100 perfectly uniform model tissue. You see the initiation of what looks like a reentry that quickly terminates on its own. It's a complete one cycle. The clinical equivalent, if you will, of an extra beat or a PVC. Okay? If we decrease the gap junction coupling fivefold, uniformly, the individual cardiomyocytes still retain their full complement of ion current and subjected to the same stimulation protocol, what you see is actually this reentry is sustained, and the clinical equivalent is going from the normal sinus rhythm to a so-called monomorphic, which is like the tachycardia. And you can see even in uniform tissue that actually the monomorphic, which is the tachycardia, can break up into more fermentatory behavior. This is not, this is not reconstructed electrocardiograms, these are real electrocardiograms, but this is ventricular fibrillation, okay, so-called stat line setting cardiac death, which as you know, affects in the neighborhood of 300,000 Americans each year. So gap junction coupling alone is highly important to ventricular arrhythmias. And so the nature of the coupling is a highly important question, not just in biology, but uh, uh, in health. So what do we know about that? Well, gap junctions are formed by so-called connectin proteins, the 21 human connections. All connections have four transmembrane domains, or TNN termini, or cytoplasmic. Okay? And just to go over the nomenclature here, these connectins uh, are, are formed hemichannels, and each hemichannel is a hexamer. So one connects on, XON, is really a hemichannel or a hexamer of connectin proteins. And <coughs> connectins are there's a new nomenclature, but the traditional nomenclature is still used to, uh, uh, by size. And okay, so 43 is, is, is 43 to the size. When one hemichannel of connection sticks out of the membrane of one cell, it hooks up with the hemichannel of an adjoining cell, which form a gap junction. And then, as we discussed earlier, gap junctions tend to localize a cell cell border region into so called plaques. Okay? We know why, rather, uh, uh, we, we know why they should localize at, at cell cell border regions or in the cardiomyocytes in a state of this. So the natural spread of excitation, the question is how? How is it that they end up localizing in these plastic, specifically at cell cell border regions? And so there's been a lot of work on connections. It's, it's, in some ways, it's been a model channel, although um, it doesn't have a lot of the voltage gain that many of the other ion channels have. Um, and, but a lot of work in the 90s culminated in two big papers, really, in 2002, okay, which put out the model. It was, it was established in the 90s that connections are trafficked along microtubules. So once they're formed in the ER, uh, they form into the hemi channels and connect on to the Bolton where they're packaged into vesicles and basically hop onto microtubules. And on the microtubules, they're trafficked out to the plasma membrane. Once in the plasma membrane, fluid mosaic model. They're inserted indiscriminately into the plasma membrane, and then they slope laterally to localize at so-called interplated disk. The problem with this model, and it's, and it's really, I had some hesitation because the sort of penultimate author on this paper is Roger Chen, and so he, his status recently changed a bit in a, in a positive direction, but what the heck. Um, 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 the, the, um, the, 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 the questions we have with this model is that, first of all, connections have a half-life depending on what you look at and who you ask, 45 minutes to several hours. Usually it's about an hour for cardiac connection. 
So that's a small amount of time for them to get on the membrane, no time to have the integrated dish. There's no known carriers, and that's the second problem. There's no known carriers that traffic the connections from the membrane to specifically integrated dish. So why should they insert indiscriminately just to localize the one small region only for a relatively short half-life? So with all these kind of questions, we ask, is there a different mechanism of connecting to the and so, mm -hmm. knowing that connect this traffic on microtubules, we went back to basics, okay? So we took cell lines, HeLa cell. HeLa cells produce very little endogenous connections. So they're really popular model to use, model cell. And we transfected them with connecting tags with the other fast and protein, YFP. Fix the cell, stay for alpha tubule. And we can see when the cells have very few neighbors, what they have is they actually end up co-localizing. So, this is a connector 43. This is the alpha tubule. So we're laying out the microtubular structure, fixed cell. And then when we uh, 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 merge the signal, we see it, so the, the yellow, which indicates connection and microtubules really overlaying each other. Not a big surprise, okay? We've sort of really learned that from a lot of previous work. Connections go along microtubules. Now, microtubules are notoriously sensitive to fixation. So we then did it live cells, which co-transfected live cells with tag connecting with one wavelength and tag alpha tubulin to lay out the microtubules, but with a different kind of fluorophore. And we did actually epifluorescent deconvolution microscopy uh, uh, in this study. And what we found is that the, uh, uh, so these are two separate cells, again, live cells. Um, this is sort of blue fly sort of visionary nucleus of one cell, nucleus of the other cell. And this is the cell cell border region with original connection of the cell cell border region. And what we see is that at the border region, there seems to be a more intimate relationship between the connection plasma and the microtubules than would otherwise be suggested. They read microtubules really seem to be hooking up with connection plasma at the cell cell border region. And if we look at that a little bit more closely, so here's the connection signal, the alpha tubulin signal, the merge image, and here we just actually manually, for each plane of the plaque, we manually drew out the microtubules red from the one cell, blue from the other cell, and we see where there's plaque in green, the microtubules, where there's no plaque, there are no microtubules. So there's an intimate relationship at the plaque between microtubules and connection. And that, that's in a live pair of cells, but it's in one instant in time. So the next question is, what happens over time? And so to address that, we turn to another technique known as FRAP. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with it. It's a long name, but pretty simple. Fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. So we zap the cells with, uh, or a specific region of the cells with fluorescence um, to really bleach the fluorophores. And so that bleaching doesn't recover. So when we see new recovery of fluorescence, it's coming from another source. Let me show you what I mean. So here's one cell, here's a second cell. Here's a plaque between two cells in a cell chamber. Now this is done with a confocal microscope. And so what we do is we sit back for a few minutes and just image the plaque and just look, look at the top right. And then we zap the plaque, okay? And then check back and continue to collect images. And what we see actually is recovery, this on the time scale of minutes, recovery within the plaque, and they just go back to the first image, but it's quantified down here, and that we see recovery within the plaque much higher than recovery in the non plaque region. And so, where is this recovery coming from? This is, it seems like it's just suddenly reappearing in the plaque. It's probably not coming from the surrounding region. It's probably on the time scale of minutes, it's probably coming right into the plaque. What can occur so rapidly? What can deliver new connections into the plaque so rapidly over time course of minutes for microtubules, which really exist on the time course of minutes? And so, looking at microtubules, this is from the same experiment, but we extended it. This experiment from the previous slide pre bleach, post bleach, and five minutes post bleach. But then, in the presence of metatazole, which disrupts microtubules, as does encapsule, disrupting microtubule function we see much less recovery at five minutes of SAC regions, and it is quantified on the right. And so as we build our model, we build our understanding of how connections are getting to the plaque, 
what we have is, based on these time course experiments, based on these drug experiments, we have microtubules are able to directly deliver connection to the plaque. And the next question that we had is, why is the plaque at the cell cell border? Why is it here? Why isn't it here or here? And so from that, we had a bit of a clue from the cell cell border region. And the cell cell border regions are really zipped out by coherent base adherence junctions. That's kind of like the zipper that sews up cell cell borders. And it's homotypic coherent coherent interaction that really makes the bond between cells. And so if we asked, what happens if we disrupt the coherent coherent interaction? We did that by using extracellular peptides or peptides directed against the extracellular domain of coherence. And in the presence of these peptides, where the control cells to see plaque between two cells, this is high resolution, this is nuclear two separate cells, we see actually this coherent between the cells and uh, this plaque that overlays with the coherent. In the presence of coherent blocking peptides, we see um, actually no plaque, and quantitatively we did that as well. The plaques really didn't form when we interfered with coherent, even when the cells were jammed up close to each other. So if we sort of, as we build our story, we kind of have two ends of the bridge. We have connection of being delivered to the plaque by microtubules, and we have the localization somehow is coherent related. And the question, of course, now is how do microtubules deliver to the coherent complexes? And then we actually had a few clues. One of that is dynamic microtubules rely on these microtubule plus N binding proteins or plus N tracking proteins on the tip proteins. Okay, prominent member be a DB1, N binding protein 1. And what happens is microtubules sort of grow and then they retract or suffer catastrophe. And this growth phase and even cortical capture depends on, in part, at least DB1. Okay? And the um, the, the actual capsule that we use, I said it disrupted microtubule function. Technically, capsule is a microtubule stabilizer, but what it's been shown to do is it displaces DD1 from microtubule. So with both these data, we said, okay, what does DD1 do in terms of connection delivery? What does DD1 do near a plaque, near a cell cell border? And so we went back to our cell line transfected with a tag DB1 and tag connection. So this is the connection signal on the right. So again, high resolution, this is 10 microns. Um, and we have a cell cell border region here. And uh, so one cell uh, and the second cell and the uh, uh, developing plaque between the two cells, okay? And then this is the tag DB1. DB1 exists as a plus and a microtubule and the way it looks is actually like common, okay? So the short little segment is the flat end of the microtubules. The rest of the microtubules follows down here, like that. And this is, we actually have a movie of this. It's five times faster than real time. So not slow down that much. Uh, if I can slow it in real time. And what we have is that actually microtubules, they look like they're even sort of swimming. But what I want to point out is they're congregating. If you want to have microtubules, are congregating at the cell cell border regions. Okay? So notice in non contact regions, so contact with the cell membrane that's not in contact with other cells, there's no EB1 to microtubules are relatively sparse for EB1 to microtubules. However, at cell cell border regions, EB1 to microtubules are hanging out there. And quantitatively, we can show that they last longer there than they last in other regions. And they're there, and it's visually obvious that they're there more frequently than in other regions. So, so another way that we turn this easy one tip microtube is anchored at cortical membrane. Which cortical membrane? Cortical membrane at cell cell border regions. So we mentally like to visualize, okay, so easy one tip microtubes are at the cell cell border regions that allows connections to be delivered or offloaded from the microtube right to the plaque. The problem is that we'd love to see that. And we can't see that, or at least couldn't see that with epifluorescent images, okay? Because no matter how much we try to get rid of the plaque or bleach it or whatnot, there still is residual signal. And when we look at individual vesicles of protein, there's too much background. 
But if you're trying to go after direct visualization, we turn to another technique known as total internal reception or as microscopy. And so very briefly, turn to the technique is used the laser. You shine a laser at an angle uh, uh, through a publicist uh, into aqueous media. That's the interface. Um, change of refractive index between the glass and the, and the media, there'll be a refraction of the light. And at a certain acute enough angle, you'll get reflection. Okay? Fortunately, at the point of reflection, most of the, the light is reflected, there's an evanescent wave that's given off. This evanescent wave drops off exponentially. And so, long story short, the point of paraphrastography is you have it very localized in, in terms of the uh, deep depth very localized excitation. And, uh, and the fact that you have a localized excitation field, you don't catch up background fluorescence from the rest of the cell. So we could use TERF to see really just what's at the membrane, what's underneath the membrane. One other problem we had overcome, gap excuse me, gap should occur at cell cell border regions. We want to look at the cover slip cell interface. And we got around that problem by, by really placing the cover slip with the extracellular domain of cadherin. So we fooled the cell into thinking that the cell cover slip region is like a cell cell border region. It forms adherence junctions with the cover slip, if you will. And the, by doing that, so we, ha we actually created a nice control. So we have cover slip with cadherin, cover slip without cadherin. And we looked at by turf microscopy, so through the cover slip, right just at the membrane, or what's on the right underneath the membrane. So when we look at cells transfected with connection by turf, so now again, we're not looking at the whole cell, we're looking just what's right underneath the membrane. What we see is that, um, sorry, so in the top is the, uh, the, the, the cadherin cover, cover, uh, cover slip, in the bottom is cover slip without cadherin. And what we see, this is one minute uh, of images, is actually, this is connection that's already in the membrane. Notice here that the point that becomes bright and gets fixed. There's another one that's trying to probe down here, and I think we have to see another one start to appear over here. There you go. Quick path in, and get it fixed, and then the movie will pay it after a minute. What we see when the cadherin in the cover slip that the that the connections have a very short path then, get bright and it's fixed in the membrane. We take that as a, a membrane fusion event. Okay? And in contrast, when the cover slips don't have cadherin, what we see is we have see a lot of submembranous activity. These connections are, are traveling underneath the membrane, but they never really, well, they much less frequently get bright and fixed. They have long path lengths, they more often disappear than actually come into the membrane itself. And, and so we can look at that just uh, when I trace out the path lengths of the different connection that we see in the cadherin and the cover slip, the individual path lengths have short path lengths and then marked by squares, they have fixed events, all right? So they, 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 they call those fusion events. They become come into the membrane and they would again much brighter. Do you see those disappear? Only okay. after minutes, many minutes. Much longer than this time frame. Much longer than this time frame. And when there's no cadherin in the cover slip, uh, what we see is actually much more sort of meandering, if you will, with a much longer path length with much fewer fusion events. <coughs> okay? And so the way we uh, 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 mentally visualize this is that these EB1 tip microtubules that are carrying the connection are traveling right underneath the cortical membrane. They have to be right underneath. The turf only captures within 100 nanometers of just those. So it's only right underneath the membrane, but they don't ever anchor onto the membrane for the delivery event. When this can here in the membrane, the E1 tip microtubules really are able to anchor, which allows the connection to be delivered. And in fact, when we look at E B1 signal with the same kind of cover slips, with cadherin and without cadherin, what we see is when there's cadherin in the membrane, we see a lot of E B1 activity right underneath the membrane, zooming around and sort of stopping briefly. So it we it's sliding, if you will, along the membrane with occasional stopping points. We see much less EB1 activity when there's no cadherin in the membrane. And so as in cartoon form, we see EB1 tip microtubules coming really and associating with the membrane 
allowing for connection that it carries to be delivered into the membrane when there's no adherent junction in the membrane, we don't have a delivery equal. Can, can you make some kind of lithography and deposit perfume in small islands or well, neighboring regions without perfume? Yes. In the same yes. I, you know, it's a great question. Can we know by answering it yes? And let me show you in two slides because I wasn't going to touch on it, but since you asked, that's a great question. So I'll, I'll get to it. In, actually, I think it's the next slide. Am I not? Okay, sorry. One more slide after this. And so I don't want to get into the method of detail too much uh, right here, but um, uh, briefly, we use, we, we complain some of our studies with SIRNA, knockdown technology. So, um, uh, connect the 43 signal, which is attack between cells, like a control population of cells. This is DB1 signal, uh, where we knock down uh, DB1 with siRNA, which is much less, mess, uh, much less plaque formation. And then the adherence junction complex actually um, um, has several actors. One of them is um, P150 glued, which is part of the dynamic action complex, which is to help anchor them even one to microtubules at the adherence junction uh, and with uh, plaque form and then with the presence of one fifty glue knocked out, we see much less plaque formation. And the cytoplasmic actor of adherence, they're part of the adherence junction complex, but the microtubule binding uh, uh, factor uh, uh, of cadherin is actually beta to tenon, and we see connection signal, beta to tenon signal in the presence of beta to tenon knockdown. We see much more less back formation at cell cell border regions. And so, uh, 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 again, to uh, your question, um, what happens when we, we have an uneven distribution of cadherin? So, what we actually notice in some cells, by white field amphiofluorescence, they look like they uniformly have connected. But in, uh, by turf microscopy, we uh, notice that there are patchy regions. And we know um, uh, really that. Uh, for other sort of membrane that, that stated, we know these, these patchy regions are indeed membrane on the cell surface. But if our theory is correct, these patchy regions should correlate to less regions of, 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 of microtubule-based delivery. And in fact, in this particular cell, we uh, 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 fixed this, went back and stained by immuno, so this is a live cell, um, went back and stained by immunocytochemistry uh, the microtubules are gaining for alpha tubulin, and what we saw is actually these patchy regions are laid out by a relative paucity of microtubules. And so, actually, in the same cell, we're just like lucky, and we saw back when it was still living, that actually, if you see the so called gap, what you notice is a bit of a, a, a pro, a sugar pro, if you will. Well, just remember, we looked at tag connection. It looks like it's actually coming across the gap, inserting into a pack. And if you look carefully, you can see actually individual connection packets coming along the microtubule, inserting into the pack, and actually packing a little bit bigger. And to answer Igor's question, we asked actually why there would be this irregular region. And it turns out that in this particular subspecies, and it happened quite a bit with us, connection was was um, unevenly placed uh, um, on the subspecies. And so it actually was enriched in this region. And because it's enriched in this region, the microtubules inserted there and actually never got beyond that region. But that was just an observation when they moved further than that. But it really does seem like the microtubules were attracted and therefore changed the direction of them. Uh, uh, the cadherin was uh, uh, attracting the microtubules and therefore changing the direction of the microtubules being laid out, creating sort of a microtubule and had a connection of shadow. Okay, so the, the, the targeting model um, that we have, just in purely cartoon form, is that microtubules, rather than being discriminatively inserted in the plasma membrane, insert, when they're tipped with DB1, insert at cell cell border regions. And with this insertion, connections are directly delivered from the microtubule into the cell cell border. So if you will, the connections are the final readout of, of really a targeting scheme that's set up by the cytoskeleton. And so we've gone off, uh, so we've taken this paradigm, and we've, we've, we've gone in three different directions. 
And so the one direction is, uh, is, is how easy to connect with your solution to plasma memory. And I can help anybody who has questions about it afterwards. It's still uh, uh, in uh, um, a project that's the Venice Canal Lab. The quick answer is we don't think it diffuse very much at all. But again, I'll be happy to discuss that more uh, 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 later. Similarly, we were asking, do other ion channels follow the same model of targeted delivery? And we're actually looking at the outside calcium channel or CAB 1.2 and look at delivery of uh, 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 CAB 1.2. Uh, does it follow a tip protein uh, uh, mediated delivery to uh, uh, cardiac tissue growth? Um, and that's a well, no Why didn't you look at this case? Some ion channels are going to be localized with the uh, sudden channels. Yeah. Uh, so they. Exactly, and and um, the, the uh, my preference was sodium channel for that reason, but I think the Kong was going to lab um, wanted to look at calcium channel, and so for practical reasons, I I said pick your channel, but you pick the calcium channel. No, 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 no it's just yeah. the sodium one. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of evidence. And so I have evidence to localize it and explain it. Absolutely, and, and, um, and, and there's a lot of interest in sodium channels with the androids based uh, uh, targeting. So it, it's a personal favorite, but we haven't done any work on it yet, but uh, um, would like to. Um, the, the, the final reason that we have done a bit of work, and uh, um, it, it's the rest of the uh, story I, I'd like to spend the rest of the time on, is uh, the standard of stress affect connection to the and, uh, and that's work being done by another postdoc in the lab, uh, Jenny Smith, um, who's really, really helped develop a lot of both images of biochemistry uh, uh, in the lab. And so it's been increasingly recognized, as well known in ischemic reperfusion injury, that oxidative stress is involved in ischemic reperfusion. And actually, it's been increasingly recognized that oxidative stress is an important component of. of, of ischemia as well, uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, oxidative stress is particularly useful to us because we can simulate it easy with hydrogen peroxide um, and, and, and it's highly conducive to imaging. So for all those reasons, we, we pick oxidative stress, uh, at least the oxidative stress component of ischemia. And what we did is, in neonatal cardiomyocytes, we said, what happens if we expose neonatal cardiomyocytes to hydrogen peroxide? And the answer is not that surprising, okay? And so these are neonatal cardiomyocytes. Um, this is antibody staining. The, the, the red in coherent uh, uh, and the and coherent, and the green is connected. And what we see in the presence of oxidative stress, we see much less, and this is a blow up over here, much less connection of the cell cell border region. And the coherent, it's actually interesting, it's not just marking the cell cell border region, this is the red signal, the end coherent. But notice in the presence of oxidative stress, connection is getting there, but the coherent, issue the coherent is getting there, but the connection is not getting there. Okay? So it seems like that sort of target, that anchor for the microtubules is intact, but the connection is not getting there. It's not getting, if you will, delivered. I don't want to poo poo cell biology, yeah. but you, I mean, I look at other bits of the vehicle picture and I see green spots on red lines to the right, and then I see red lines with nothing up above, so... You're absolutely right. First sentence. We're yeah. all physiologists. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you're absolutely right. And there's a lot of green, there's a lot of red, okay? Um, um, if, if you don't mind, we'll take that as a first pass. There's left at the back. That's a lot of other stuff going on as well. Yeah. Um, and then, and, um, but I won't ignore that. I'm, I'm coming to it. Um, um, and, uh, and just by biochemistry, we, uh, uh, by so-called co-IP experiments, uh, you guys are familiar with co-IP, we do uh, you know, uh, uh, precipitation of so-called pull-down of the protein, lock for a second protein to see what you can do together with that initial protein. And when we uh, pull down uh, coherent, we're blocked for connection, we see less connection associated with coherent in the presence of hydrogen peroxide. The time force of the this, this, this particular experiment was done in 12 hours. And so you, you use the term that the 
can hear it gets there, but the connection doesn't. How do you know the can hear and just even turned over? Maybe it never goes anywhere in that 12 hours. That's correct. We don't know. Yeah, and okay. have a measure. Um, okay, so connection is not there, adherent is there, is there a delivery issue? And so from our previous work, we, uh, uh, we said, what about easy one? And then we had actually a really interesting result, um, a surprising result, frankly. Um, these are uh, these are actually here, that's what the same as you put in my bag. Um, in the red are microtubules, in the green is DB1. I can't remember this comment that the plot ends are microtubules, okay? And um, in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, we get less comments and the more dispersion of DB1. Basically, it looks like hydrogen peroxide, and this is highly reproducible. I mean, I say that is we're so surprised by the results. Um, not so DB1 from the plasma are microtubules. And, and by biochemistry, we see the same thing. Uh, 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 if we pull down for EV1 and we black for alpha tubulin, we see much more alpha tubulin associated with EV1 um, without hydrogen peroxide than with the presence of hydrogen peroxide. And so, okay, so if EV1 is coming off a of microtubule in, in, in the presence of oxidative stress, does that mean that that EV1 gets microtubule inter interfacing with the plasma membrane? And, um, the, the answer is, is yes. This is actually an experiment that we now interpret microscopy again looking at uh, uh, cells transfected with EV1 tagged to GFP. And this is uh, a two minutes of imaging. And uh, you can see the EV1 traveling right underneath the plasma membrane. <coughs> In the presence of hydrogen peroxide, same field. We see sort of a general background signal. We take that as a First, EV1, these are the same lookup tables that are highly controlled for uh, uh, same imaging conditions. And we see much less EV1 single to plasma membrane when we wash out hydrogen peroxide. We see actually a return of EV1 interacting with the plasma membrane. So EV1 is, for, is knocking off, issue the oxidative stress is knocking off EV1 from microtubules and limiting EV1 to microtubule interaction with the plasma membrane. So then if we follow the previous work, we look at connections and look at connection delivery in the presence of hydrogen peroxide uh, as a model for oxidative stress. But this year I want to bring up some nagging issues from our previous work that we really tried to resolve with, with our current studies. And that's the one is that it's hard to eliminate background signal from the human protein, even by terp microscopy. Uh, 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 if we want to take a whole cell population and not just zoom up on individual subsections, how do we get rid of existing connections when we want to look at new delivery? And on that note, it's really hard to separate absolute delivery rate. We're going to look at change in the membrane content of connections uh, from delivery minus, or if you will, exocytosis minus endocytosis rate. Okay? And finally, what we lead to is really the main point is it's hard to distinguish recycled protein from the novel protein. If we want to look at connections, coming out of the Golgi. How can we look at de novo connection coming out of the Golgi, going to the membrane, and get rid of the whole recycling issue? And for this, we actually developed a, 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 a different kind of assay. We created a cell line of reducible connection. So yeah, um, uh, uh, we put a cat responsive element in front of the connection. What that means is that when the Cells are exposed to tetracycline or it's analog doxycycline, it induces connection. When there's no doxycycline, there's no connection. Okay? So here's the cell, it's a stage for connection, and, and uh, in green, you don't see any because there's none that has been transcribed and translated, and in blue are the nuclei. In the presence of doxycycline, connection shows up in the cell. Okay? And then this is a stable cell line total population. And so we then just did timing experiments. We said, well, what's the time course that this expression occur? So if time equals zero is when we expose the cells to doxycycline, at one and a half hours, just one and a half hours, we notice that connection shows up in the Golgi. And an hour later, two and a half hours, connection appears at the memory. So it, it collects in the Golgi in the first hour and a half, 
and then in the next hour, it starts getting delivered to the, to the memory. We know it's no, but it didn't exist two and a half hours ago. And so there, we actually have a nice way to uh, create our oxidative stress, because at two hours, we then can expose the cells to hydrogen peroxide, and over the next short time window, in the next hour or so, we're just looking at the traffic in the OG to connection. We're not worried about transcription, but it's not going to get there anyway. We're not worried about recycling protein, but there's no prior recycling protein, but we're just looking at Golgi to plasma membrane trafficking. And what we see in the, the result here uh, in six cells, uh, 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 sorry, still frames rather, um, here's a, a two cells that we study. One exposed to a vehicle at time equal zero, one exposed to hydrogen peroxide. This is two and a half hours after the exposure to a vehicle of hydrogen peroxide. Okay? This is, by the way, this is turf microscopy, so we're looking only at the membrane. Two and a half hours, neither cell has any connection at the membrane. 45 minutes later, connection is accumulated in the plasma membrane, uh, whereas in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, it doesn't get there. And similarly, in another 45 minutes, we get very little accumulation in the hydrogen peroxide traded cell. I think these are movies here, just with uh, uh, you see accumulation over that two hours of imaging. Mm -hmm. And um, in the cell tree of hydrogen peroxide, we don't see any connection. And, and the biochemical uh, 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 experiments back this up very nicely. Um, and that use a technique known as surface bioaccumulation to essentially an assay for the, for the surface associated protein. All we see is that these are negative controls, but we get a lot of surface connection, and this is actually uh, taken at four hours, but in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, we get very little connection. And so, okay, that's the cell biology. What happens in the heart? Um, and uh, I'll just be finishing up with this. Um, we uh, have a collaborator, Neil Chi. Neil Chi is, is now going off to San Diego, sorry, he's only happy in, in, in San Diego. Um, uh, but Neil Chi uh, did his postdoctoral work with Didier Sanier at UTSF, and, and Didier had a zebra fish lab. Um, and amongst other work that, uh, uh, that they did, um, together we really developed this sort of optical mapping in zebra fish heart. And, I don't want to say that zebrafish biology here, and I'm honestly not the person to do it. But briefly, in zebrafish uh, uh, are translucent. And so the embryos, uh, uh, we can see the heart through, through their skin uh, in the embryos. And the other advantage of zebrafish is they develop very rapidly. So within a few hours, the heart starts beating. Okay? It really is formed within 12, uh, and beating within that 12 to 24 hours. Okay? Um, and so we said, Neil actually made a couple of lines of zebrafish. The one is a tag connector. It's got a transgenic where it overexpresses. It connects, and this is uh, connected to 48.5, tagged with GFP. And at 48 hours, this is, this is uh, the, 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 six, the fish were fixed, and this is a uh, reconstructed confocal uh, uh, image of the zebrafish heart, which is a single cell thick heart at 48 hours. And what you notice is you can see at the cell cell border, connection is laying out the cell cell border. In other words, saying that the connection is at the cell cell border. A little bit harder with using antibody staining on zebra fish, but even the antibody staining, I'm sorry, I should have made it a little bit brighter, you can see coherence, which is antibody staining against coherence at the cell cell border region. In the presence of hydrogen peroxide, and this is hydrogen peroxide in the nanomotor uh, range, you actually, in the same time course, the connection is there, but it actually is not at the cell cell border region. There's still in the cytoplasm, and the, the hole is in the cytoplasm. Oh, what is the scale? So that scale, yeah, I didn't, mark, I didn't mark it myself, but I can tell you that this here is probably on the order of, it's probably on the order of 120 microns. Yeah. So just a few dozen cells in the whole Yeah, a few dozen hard cells, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. And then and, and they one cell, you know, the chambers are one cell there. Um, and the, uh, and so uh, uh, Neil made a second line of transgenic fish, 
and this was a uh, 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 um, fish that uh, overexpressed uh, GCAMP. GCAMP is a toxin sensitive chlorophore. Okay, and in this audience, I'm not going to talk about mapping too much. All right, so go easy on me. But uh, um, um, the GCAMP is, is put in front of, uh, put behind a cardiac specific promoter. So in the heart, there's a calcium fluorescence. And with that, it's a, a relatively crude, but it's an adequate way to measure propagation of excitation by following the calcium transients over space. And so in the deeper fish uh, uh, that are overexpressed in G camps, we can actually map calcium transients. And what we see is that if controlled is a normal AV node to outflow track at 48 hours, AV node to outflow track, rapid spread of excitation, and, and uh, Conduction velocity is, I don't want to just show it to you here, the conduction velocity is about these 40 centimeters per second um, from student. Uh, in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, uh, we see actually it's a more irregular activation. I'm going to try to repeat that for you. Um, that takes longer to develop, AV node outflow track. You see it takes longer to develop, and it's actually more irregular. longer to develop and then it finally does passage and it takes longer to fill the heart and we get a much uh, diminished uh, uh, peak. Yeah, it's really good. See how I can do this together. Um, okay. Excuse me, can you explain this uh, lines? It's post AV excitation time. Conduction velocity. How do you measure conduction velocity? These lines are just, what we did is actually by a threshold, um, we picked isochrones, and the line represents the time between isochrones uh, over space, so it essentially includes conduction velocity. And what we, what we essentially, um, uh, uh, what we found, and I'm, I'm sorry I don't have really synchronized, is it takes much longer as the cost of the AV node in the control cell versus the AV node. Uh, in the cell treated with uh, hydrogen peroxide, the actual potential is a, a relatively short time to develop and spread across the main chamber of the heart, whereas it's a relatively longer time from the AV node to the outflow track. As I go, there's more of a delay in the trying to develop, and then it's, it finally does spread, and when it spreads, it spreads at, you know, at, at, at best one. And so um, um, I should mention uh, 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 in early studies in human heart from chronic dilated ischemic cardiomyopathy, we see actually decreased EV1 at the interclated disc, decreased connection, more intracellular connection, and we actually also do an annual perfusion isolated mouse heart in which uh, it was subjected to ischemic reperfusion injury, and we have similar imaging and biochemical results. And so our model is that if normally EV1 to microtubule is attached to uh, 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 adherence junction, delivering connection right to cell cell or any border regions or the part indicated disc region in the presence of oxidative stress, EV1 is displaced off the microtubule, preventing delivery of connection to the interpolated disc. And with that, I just want to thank uh, uh, the people in my group, especially Jenny Smith, who is work I presented in the second half of this uh, talk continued through the past and channel traffic and then changes in the mouse work. And um, and really continues to be highly supportive uh, 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 of the group and, and very much the first part of the work with that is her lab uh, in collaboration with both Mark and Bustro and Manoj as part of Mark's lab. Thanks very much. Show that the uh, uh, can, uh, can hear in, uh, on the slip and in uh, the what do you call it, those spot or plaques don't move much, right? They don't. That's correct. Right? That's correct. That's correct. Why don't they move? Because if you have if you have you know homogeneous hearing, why don't they just go to other places? What's the 
when he when we can't do the why why are you ready in the membrane or yeah in the membrane why why do we <coughs> always keep going to the same spot when when they retract and they come back right right so and um, if I don't want to put words in your mouth but if I rephrase that um, why are microtubules attracted to a specific region in the membrane why are microtubules attracted to a hair junction in the first place is that fair Well, I, I mean, all right. Without without rephrasing your question, why why uh, the dash with the is broken? Not some religious thing. I just <laughs> it keeps going to sleep and come out again. Well, well why do um, why do microtubules go to one specific region? Is that is that what you're asking? I want to make sure. And they use it as well, 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 I, understand, topic. I understand that yeah. you said that, that there's a coherence there, and so right. that's why you, right. you know, the, the, the right. magnitude will boost it. Right. But then, even with coherence, even with the screw effect, you have microtube, the, each right. individual tube, microtube only goes to one spot. Yeah, and so um, the, 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 the true answer, I don't know, but what we've observed is that Microtubules beget microtubules. So when you stain out for alpha tubulin, so when you stain for microtubules, in, uh, not even stain, if you, if you introduce tag alpha tubulin, so one of the main proteins that make up microtubules, and you look at the cell over time, so in a live cell, microtubules look incredibly stable. They're kind of fixed, even over minutes. But when you stain for EV1, or rather not saying when you introduce tag EV1, so you look at the dynamic situation, you see actually EV1, this, this, what we thought was the same microtubule, had more and more EV1 coming down its track and uh, uh, inserted in the membrane. And what um, we actually are looking at more carefully is that microtubules are not just staying in the same place, but m new microtubules follow the track laid out by the previous microtubules. And so and so that's why we say microtubules beget microtubules. And you know, there's some theory on this, is EV1 is actually a dimer and it can actually cross talk between two different microtubules, truly theoretical. Um, and uh, why do they end up at, you know, there's not a magnetic force attracting EV1 to microtubules to the cell cell border region. So why do they end up localizing there? And then we think really it's a stochastic process. Well, if one of them finds its way there, and if that one happens to last a little bit longer, be anchored longer to that membrane, other ones will follow its track. It's a nucleation. And nucleation, that's a great way of saying it. That's our best explanation. So I have a question. I'm sure you've heard this question probably many yeah. times. I, in fact, I remember somebody asked Natalia Trajano who was asking you this question at one of the conferences, but still because time was limited, right. so you didn't have the time to answer. But the question essentially is, in the system you're studying, uh, in those cells you have plenty of room inside. But if you look at the actually adult uh, myocytes, which are packed with sarcomeric proteins, right. like mitochondria, etc., sarcoplasmic mm -hmm. tissue, mm -hmm. there's not much room really for those microtubules to yeah. run back and forth like that. Yeah. How do they find this path in between very yeah. great distance? Right, and that's, and that's a great question that we initially answered about 15 years. But we started to look at it. <laughs> um, and so after, uh, I forget which meeting it was, but after that meeting, somebody put me aside and, uh, and, and showed their, their, their EM data that showed microtubules stretching actually from nuclei all the way through sarcomere <laughs> to the plasma membrane. And what I can tell you from our own experience is that actually what we see is a bit of a staggered path. And so we see that microtubules hit a, hit a sarcomere and kind of had a, give it a, a bit of a kink, and they keep going. And so, and for that very reason, when, and Tina and, and I were actually discussing that just an hour ago, for that very reason, we're really trying to understand how the cytoskeleton is laid out in, 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 in cardiomyocytes and we're actually quite shocked at how little is understood. And so, yeah, but for, for, for just that reason, we, 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 we're 
you're trying to understand. What I can tell you that for both others and our uh, 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 observation is that they really do stretch through the sarcomere, although they do experience some kind of kink as they hit a sarcomere and act in that as well. Well, that's a question. Very nice question. Uh, will you apply hydrocarbons to the oxidative condition? Will that interfere with your fluorescent images? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Um, the so first of all, certainly changes in pH. Will, will, will affect the fluorophores yeah. and their emission. Um, we have not observed, and the, and the reason I pause is because it's, it's, it's a good point. When we expose cells to hydrogen peroxide, I can tell you their, their overall fluorescence in that immediate time period doesn't change. Okay, And I'm I was just trying to think if I could come up with a more intelligent, well-controlled answer to that question. I'm not sure we've done it. What about the post <laughs> photo Yeah. And, and, and well, but, but photobiology is not oxidation, right? And so, and, 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 and so, and, and there's a lot more energy applied with photobiology, you know, in, in terms of direct laser shot at the fluorophores, as opposed to hydrogen <coughs> that really gives the cell tolerance quite well. Um, but we should control that, aside from just saying, well, we throw in hydrogen peroxide, and for the next few minutes, we don't see much change at all. But uh, we'll do that control. It's not any question at all. Yeah. Why do you say photo is not oxygen? Oh, I'm sorry. It is, but what I meant in terms of the relative energy okay. that, that that's going on photo bleaching compared to to hydrogen peroxide. It's, it's two different ballparks. So I would like to also follow up on the same uh, issue. Yeah. Uh, so we know that the mixing uh, the change from sporulation state <coughs> under the oxidative stress conditions. Uh, in your Westerns, you only show one. One line. Have you seen any, any switch between different positions if you want to? Do? Right, right, right. And and so there is um, 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 there is a change in, um, when you talk about lines. We're looking at the block here, okay? And we're looking at sort of a, a, a separation when we when we block for for connection and and um, uh, based on phosphorylation state. Um, we do see changes. Yeah, and we do see actually um, a, uh, quite a big change in phosphorylation. Let me quickly follow that up by saying um, it's antibody dependent. And so uh, with, with that, we kind of are sort of scared of the results as well. <laughs> um, and so do we see change in phosphorylation state based on how we block you know, with antibody block? Yes. But it's actually telling us antibodies, I, I'm just not sure. So, um, and it gets to a larger issue because you know a lot of the previous work was was about down regulation of phosphorylation. You know, which it would tell you in, in a lot of this work, you know, came out of Jeff, uh, came from Jeff Sabbath, this change in phosphorylation um, um, causes a down regulation of connection. And that may certainly be happening, but the, the, the point that we're really going after. Whether or not phosphorylation state is affecting this is not so much a down regulation, is a lack of forward traffic. So, you know, it certainly can be phosphorylated. Is that applying to the traffic in? We're not sure. So, Orvin, you, men you mentioned the work, I don't, I don't want to get into detail. <coughs> the hypothesis that you have about delta calcium channels going to the deep tubules is that they share a similar mechanism. Yeah, then we actually are finding that just like the adherence junction complex, there is a T tubal anchor um, uh, for for a microtubule pit protein, different than EV1. So, so it's not coherent, it's something else. It's not coherent and it's not EV1. And yeah. it's specific. So this microtubules know to differentiate between the two and they'll go to the T And so right, so 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 what we think in terms of this generalized scheme, if we, if we ever get there, um, is that there's, there's, there are several hip proteins, and, 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 and you know, there's, there's a whole basket of hip proteins that you know, certainly between 10 and 20 have been identified, and then what you call a hip protein. But there, there, there are a number 
of two proteins and there are a number of different membrane structures. And it really is a mixture of action. And one of the questions we're trying to address on that question is why is it that different tip proteins you know, flow to different regions of the cell? And how is it that the channel is a wave around to be delivered by a specific, specific tip protein? Uh, 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 specific molecules will the specific tip protein on it to deliver it to a specific structure. And that, you know, um, the whole goes for will be, will be staying on that for a few years. Are they encoded close knit tip proteins? I'm sorry, what's that? Are they encoded that close knit tip proteins? Don't translate it. Yeah, uh, um, uh, yes and no. I mean, really, the, sort of the tip protein field is sort of just coming into its own. Most of the work in tip protein has been done really on, on mitosis and cell division. The original tip protein is APC, and it's uh, uh, mitosis, but colon cancer. And so if what we're looking at is, a, is the, the endogenous function of these proteins, not in cancer, and in and in, and in, and in membrane protein delivery. And, but I think it's just all right, I think we'll uh, thank Robin and I each is estimating how many of those microtubes are hitting your membrane. So you're sitting here listening to you. <laughs> well, thank you very I much. I really hope so the time that those, those go to the tubules will go to the tubules, not somewhere else. Thank you. I'm sorry. Great to meet you. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you.